Avant-garde artist Yosef Boyce would have turned 100 years old this week. Boyce believed in the power of art as a tool that could influence and change both politics and society. Inspired by the Dadaists, he wanted to free art from the constriction of institutions. And with his performances, he sought ways to integrate art into everyday life. To realize this mission, Boyce also joined the anti-art movement Fluxus. Joining me now is Philip Ursprung, who has recently published a biography called Josef Boyce, Art, Capital, Revolution. Hi there, lovely to have you with us today. I want to start with this. Obviously, Josef Boyce was big in the day, but do you think, I mean, how important do you think he is today? I mean, was he... Was his art revolutionary enough to still be influential 100 years old? I think uh, he's still with us, uh, with the art today. Uh, he attempted to free art from the occupation with itself, to make it accessible, to make it something democratic, uh, to make it something that everybody could participate. And even if he didn't succeed in all his attempts, this is something which uh, continues to inspire many artists today and inspire also, I think, many people who uh, are interested in art and even those who perhaps have never heard about it. Okay, in what ways do you think he keeps inspiring artists today? I mean, he had many ideas, many concepts. So please talk us through which were the most influential. So, for instance, uh, one of his ideas was that art and politics should not be separated realms, that everybody could participate in shaping society as if he or she were an artist. He said everybody is an artist. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be a perfect musician or sculptor, but that everybody can behave as if you would give yourself a commission, be responsible for your actions, and with that contribute to shaping and changing uh, society. Uh, this is something which um, perhaps even today uh, many of us would, would wish to do or have more opportunity to do. And in looking at this art, it functions a little bit like a, a mirror image from the past reflecting what happens today. Mm, is this what he called a social sculpture? Yes, he used the term social sculpture. Again, trying to uh, improve or change not only art, but also improve and change the way politics functions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Philip, you said that he didn't think that arts and politics should be differentiated from one another, but also this really brought the understanding that he could really, you know, as Josef Boys, the, you know, grand artist, he could really like change the world, change the understanding of democracy in Europe and etc. So, in that sense, is it a bit old-fashioned to look at politics through art that way? The utopia, the dream that everybody at any time has the potential at least to interfere uh, and, and to change, this uh, has been with us uh, perhaps also in the past since the French Revolution and continues to be uh, an inspiring model. Mm -hmm. And also, Philip, he has a very interesting story, obviously. When we think of Josef Beuys, we have to think of his personal story as well, because he really was trying to come to terms with his involvement in the World War II uh, through his art. So tell us what happened to him and how he was influenced by that and whether you think his uh, you know, inclination towards making political art was due to the fact that he was trying to come to terms with this fact in his life. Yes, his role in the war uh, was an important part of his life. Uh, he was a volunteer uh, for the, the German army. He was uh, flying with uh, a bomber uh, squadrons. So he was actively and, and volunteering involved. He supported uh, the case. No? After the war, uh, he reflected on this time and he also reflected on, on his role. He tried to create a kind of a myth in order, some say, uh, to make us forget his role, others say uh, to make it even more visible. A, a myth is not 
the same thing as reality. And for him, it was a way to deal with something uh, that was crucial, but deal with it in a in a way which could be made productive also to prevent that a war would ever happen again. So this might explain his very long engagement in the peace movement, uh, fighting against uh, nuclear armament and eventually also becoming one of the founding members of the Green Party, where he was always part of the pacifist mm -hmm. uh, part. Okay. The charisma and the you know, the personal myth surrounded, uh, you know, surrounding him that obviously is tied to the story that you just told us, sort of polarized his audience. And some still think that I think um, Boyce was probably one of the first, uh, you know, modern artists that c contributed to the white male genius artist myth that is sort of still criticized on a daily basis in the art world today. How influential was he in that sense, you think? Yes, this absolutely. Uh, he was, on the one hand, trying to make art more democratic. On the other hand, he was perpetuating the myth of the white male genius artist. No? He was, everything was tied to his name. Even when he created a student party, he didn't ask the students. So this is part of his heritage. And it's, uh, of course, a part which has to be critically reflected and dealt with. Uh, but it's not possible to reduce it only to that authority because it's also an artistic model that shows how art can work in an anti authorian way. There's this part of the internal contradictions of boys making art that everybody should participate. On the other hand, many said, well, nobody understands your art. We cannot totally resolve that. And Perhaps the fact that this tension remains uh, makes that uh, one is still interested in it. The case is not closed yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, very quickly before we wrap up, I mean, um, do you think his art without the personal myth surrounding it would be, I don't know, less interesting, less valuable or perhaps less you know, worthy to remember? Uh, he was a sculptor. Uh, so if we look at the artworks, uh, they are excellent uh, formal achievements also. It's still a pleasure to wander through the installation. It's still a pleasure to see how gravity, how shape, how contrasts are dealt with. But we cannot take away the titles. The titles are part of the meaning. And we cannot take away the figure, the persona of Beuys and even the reception, the stories that he told that others have told. So in a way, it is as if he had become a kind of a monument where many, he himself, but also those that look at his work have contributed. So it's almost impossible to take away and distinguish precisely between what is the persona, what is the artist, what is the role, what is the performance, what is the work, and what are the many stories, uh, pro and contra, told about it. Lovely. It was good to have you with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Great pleasure.